Fire is a common visitor to Oregon's forests, but that doesn't mean it's a welcome one. Your forest is valuable, not just because of the timber it contains, but because of the environmental values it supports, like clean air and water and wildlife habitat. Your forest and all of its environmental and economic values can be wiped out by a wildfire, but with a little preventative maintenance, you could avoid a catastrophe. I'm Kyle Reed, Fire Prevention Specialist for the Douglas Forest Protective Association. And I'm Alicia Jones, Douglas County Extension Forester. So, how can you make your forest more resilient to wildfire? Come on, let's take a look. Forest fires can be incredibly complex to fight. Weather, terrain, and the type of fuels burning make every forest fire unique. But a fire has very simple needs. Every forest fire needs three things. Oxygen, a heat source, and fuel. Now you can't do much about controlling the oxygen or the ignition source. So the one thing you can control is the fuel. So the key to making your forest more resilient to wildfire is to reduce the fuel in your forest. And that includes all living and dead plant material within the fire area. And by removing some of that fuel, there's less for the fire to burn. It's as simple as that. Your goal is to reduce the amount of fuel for a potential future wildfire. And we've got four methods we're gonna talk about. Method one, thin your forest. Thinning your forest is the most effective tool you have for reducing the intensity of wildfire. Small and medium sized trees are both a fuel source and the path fire takes to climb into the crowns of your forest where it's even more destructive. We call these paths ladder fuels. Thinning out a significant portion of trees helps in three ways. It reduces the overall amount of fuel it helps eliminate ladder fuels that take fire up into the crowns, and it increases the space between trees so fire has a harder time spreading. When fire hits a properly thinned forest, it tends to stay low to the ground, and that spreads at a much slower rate. There are two hidden benefits to thinning your forest. Trees experience increased vigor because of the reduction in competition. These healthier trees tend to support thicker bark, which helps protect them when fire arrives. In most cases, a thin forest is a healthier forest. So, how should you thin and how much should you remove? Well, the answer is it depends. Each forest is different. So work with your forester to come up with a plan for your forest. Method two, prune your trees. Thinning a forest helps reduce ladder fuels, but even the trees that remain contain low branches, some living and some dead. Those act as ladder fuels that allow the fire to move from the ground into the crowns. So get rid of them by pruning them. Simple enough. By removing low branches, we increase the distance between a ground fire and the lowest branches on a tree. Pruning can be done with a fancy machine, or you can use a nice sharp pole saw, or even loppers. Just start at the bottom and move your way up. The only limitation is that you'll want to leave at least 50% of the live crown on any tree. A healthy crown ensures a healthy, vigorous tree. And a few quick tips on pruning. Make sure your tools are sharp. Sharp tools cause less damage to the trees. Refresh yourself on proper pruning techniques to avoid stripping bark, flush cuts, or coat hanger cuts. And when pruning conifers, it's best to avoid pruning in spring and early summer when the trees are growing and most vigorous. Fall and winter are your best bets. Method three, mechanical reduction. If your forest land contains a large amount of small trees, brush, or slash, you may want to consider mechanical reduction. Now, what does mechanical reduction really mean? For our purposes, you can think of it as a big, mean lawnmower. In some forests, the brush and ground cover vegetation can burn very hot, sending flames high into the air where they can ignite the canopy. Mechanical devices chop, chip, and crush those fuel sources to help make them much less combustible. There is a variety of equipment depending on the type of brush or slash you're trying to remove. These are industrial pieces of equipment, so you'll probably have to hire someone to get the job done. Now let's say you've done all three treatments. You've thinned your forest, you've pruned your trees, and you've mowed down some of the brush. You're done, right? Not so fast. You've actually made things worse in the short term by adding so much fuel to the forest floor. So what's next? Well, sometimes we have to get rid of the fuel. Method four, dispose of woody material. 
So far, the three methods of treatment we've talked about have left a lot of woody debris down here on the forest floor. All this will decompose over time, but in the short term, you've added a lot of fuel to the forest floor. So how do we get rid of it? Let's back up a bit and look at our earlier treatments. Prior to thinning, you should explore the opportunity of selling the trees you're about to cut. Even small trees may hold some value. If you're thinning trees larger than five inches in diameter, you may have an opportunity to sell them as saw logs to help offset the cost of your thinning efforts. Smaller trees down to three inches can be sold as posts or poles. However, almost any of it can be used as firewood. The point is, regardless of what you're taking out, do a little research to see if you can help recover some of your operational costs. For smaller amounts of slash, the answer could be as simple as chip and scatter. Using a chipper to break down limbs and trees into small pieces helps reduce their intensity as fuel. But the fuel is still there, and although you've thinned it out, there still may be a continuous layer of ground fuel throughout your forest. So the other option is to chip it and haul it. For large amounts of slash, removing the fuel from your forest is the safest strategy. This is a big operation. Chipping into a truck and hauling it away can be labor intensive and costly, but it ensures that the fuels are removed from your forest permanently. The last method to consider is piling and burning. When you have lots of small trees, brush, and slash on the ground, you can either use machinery or lots of elbow grease to make large piles. These piles need to be covered with plastic and then wait for the wet winter months until it's safe to burn them. There are some risks associated with pile and burning too. You're introducing fire onto your forest, which can cause damage to it, or worse, it could escape, leaving you liable for damage on other properties. Always take precautions when piling and burning. Pile in an open area away from structures, firewood, or any hazardous materials. Place piles at least 20 feet away from trees, snags, or downed logs. Keep piles away from streams and drainages. Align material in the pile with smaller pieces near the bottom. When the pile is almost complete, cover a portion of the pile to ensure a dry spot for later. Only burn when conditions are wet or rainy, with no wind, and after the fire restrictions have been lifted. Before you burn, you may need a permit or a smoke clearance from the Oregon Department of Forestry, so contact your local office ahead of time. And remember, this is a fire. Only burn during daylight hours. Stay with that fire while it's burning. Make sure you have fire tools and a significant water source at the burn site, and make sure that fire is completely out before you leave. So that's it. Four methods to reduce the fuels on your forest and make them more resistant to wildfires. Now, each of the methods we showed you are a bit more complicated than we had time for, and like we said at the beginning, each forest is different. So talk to a forester to determine the best plan and the best treatment for your forest. They'll help you plan the right course of action and help determine the timing of your efforts to make sure your fuels reduction is a success. I'm Kyle Reed. And I'm Alicia Jones. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoy your forests for a long, long time.